Our final segment concerns another development in increasing conflict and distrust around elections in the United States. On August 10th, in hunting for voter fraud, conspiracy theorists organized stakeouts, the New York Times reported on a developing movement to surveil ballot drop boxes. A few jurisdictions have appropriated money for cameras to train on the drop boxes. Utah now requires 24-hour video monitoring at all unattended ballot drop boxes. Arizona has adopted a pilot program at the cost of half a million dollars to record activities at 16 ballot drop boxes. The drop boxes will accept one ballot at a time, provide a receipt, and will not accept ballots if the camera is not working. Sociologically speaking, it is common for one government edict designed to prevent one harm to actually make another harm more possible or even likely. Setting up ballot drop boxes but blocking their ability to accept ballots if the camera is not working is one such case. This policy creates an opportunity for abuse and harm to the democratic process. Notably, someone can visit all the ballot drop boxes in certain areas known to be more likely to support their opponent and break the camera of every single drop box in the area because this will make it more difficult for residents of the attacked areas to vote it may reduce the vote from those areas and thus reduce the chance of the candidate those the people in those areas support to win but jurisdictions are not the only actors working to change the environment around ballot drop boxes. A coordinated movement has developed to recruit and deploy private citizens to surveil ballot drop boxes. Small surveillance actions have been advertised online, and while the stated plan is to watch the box for suspicious activity and to follow any who use a drop box back to their car and take down the license plates and numbers, some online commentators have discussed bringing AR-15s and making citizen arrests. This is a dangerous development, threatening to turn a convenient site for democratic participation into another site of politically driven violence and murder. As a sociologist and as a methodologist, I am often interested in how someone will come to know something. What methods, what procedures, will they use to answer a question they may have. As a methodologist, therefore, I wonder, how will the stakeout participants determine who to accost and arrest? Will there be some training that will teach the stakeout attendees a way to identify someone committing voter fraud from 10 feet away from the drop box? Or will the stakeout participants have to impede access to the ballot box in order to get close enough to quote unquote, investigate? And what would an investigation entail? Barring investigation, who will the stakeout attendees treat as a red-blooded American exercising their constitutional right to vote and thus ignore? And who will the stakeout attendees treat as a non-American exercising a right they do not have and a cost? Is there any chance this determination will be driven by physical traits that may mark race and ethnicity or by clothing and accessories that may mark poverty and socioeconomic class? Some drop box surveillance laws and the drop box stakeout movement are creating the conditions for intimidation and violence. Voter intimidation and the use of violence in electoral politics has a long history in the United States. Notably, prior to 1884, elections in the U.S. did not use a secret ballot. Voters often had to publicly express their preference, providing ample opportunity for pressure and intimidation. With the enfranchisement of former slaves, intimidation found even more motivation. As one example of many, Lee Formwalt writes, quote, In 1867, Southerners employed a variety of strategies to limit or deter the implementation of black civil and political rights. Their most successful means for doing so was the systematic use of violence. The most notorious example of this in the 1868 election campaign occurred in Southwest Georgia on September 19th when nearly a dozen blacks assembling for a Republican political rally in the town of Camilla were massacred. 
The Brooks Brother rioters of the election of 2000 also engaged in electoral intimidation. In that riot, paid Republican operatives joined with Republican congressional staffers in an attempt to shut down a recount in Miami-Dade County. Election officials were intimidated and did stop the count, even though doing so prevented some votes from ever being counted. And of course, most recently, supporters of then-President Trump attacked the U.S. Capitol on January 6th during the counting of the Electoral College vote. Their aim was to intimidate lawmakers or, if that failed, to kill them and to assure President Trump stayed in office despite losing both the popular vote and the Electoral College vote. In this case, their political aim was thwarted, but according to a bipartisan Senate report, they were thwarted at the cost of seven deaths and 150 injuries to law enforcement officers. So historically, U.S. elections have not been immune to violence. And judging by the deathly violence of the January 6th insurrection, the fever of violence is back with a vengeance. Consequently, it's a volatile mix. Diverse people walking up to deposit their ballot and self-appointed law enforcers in aiming to accost and or arrest anyone they deem non-American when they try to vote. Indeed, if one wanted to spread the prospect of intimidation and bloodshed from the U.S. Capitol to every community in which a ballot drop box is placed, one would be hard-pressed to come up with a better means to do so than to unleash an untrained, politically motivated, possibly armed vigilante force to monitor widely dispersed ballot drop boxes in the heat of a consequential campaign in a battleground state. But this is a zeitgeist. Legally, the public's ability to access public space without threat, to engage in legally allowed conduct, has been eroded by Supreme Court ruling, specifically in Bray v. Alexandria Women's Health Clinic, 1993, that ruled abortion protesters had a right to almost completely block access to abortion clinics. And in McCullen et al. v. Coakley in 2014, which struck down a Massachusetts law erecting a buffer around clinics within which protest was not allowed. These rulings allowed anti-abortion protesters to surround abortion clinics and to force any seeking an abortion to walk a gauntlet of insults and epithets just to enter and leave the facility. The law allowed opponents of abortion to make obtaining an abortion even more emotionally painful than the procedure necessarily is. Some abortion opponents may call that a win, but what did we lose as a society in the course of that so-called victory? Socially, militarized monitoring of ballot drop boxes by untrained individuals risks further transforming public space from a place where all enter as equals into a place where only the loudest or most threatening are welcomed. It risks further transforming voting from a ritual celebration of shared democratic community into yet another occasion in sight for invidious distinctions of so-called us and them. 24-hour citizen stakeouts of ballot drop boxes signal a new low in our level of trust and mutual respect a new low in the nation's level of social capital. No matter who wins the affected elections, this loss of capital is costly for all of us. That's This Week in Sociological Perspective. We'll be taking a break for the rest of August, but we'll be back in September with another interview with an author of some important sociological research and more sociological insights on an issue in the news. Till then, take care. If you're watching this on YouTube, I have three brief requests to make and one offer to extend. My requests? 
If you find the show or episode interesting, please like, subscribe, and comment. My offer? If you want to receive in no more than one email a week with a link to the new TWISP episode, click the link in the description and then enter your email address. By doing this, you are sure you will be notified no more than once a week about new TWISP episodes. Thanks. I appreciate it.